Greetings and welcome to Sunday service at Ananda. Uh, please take a moment to turn off your telephones and other noise kind of making devices. Uh, there's, um, there's words to the chants that are in the, the seat pockets in front of you. Please rise for the opening prayer. The voice of God calls us to awaken in him. How will he find us when he comes? Awake, yeah, yeah. When he asks us to dedicate ourselves more perfectly to him, how will he find us? Awake and ready. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. Divine Mother. Divine Mother. Friend, beloved God. Friend, beloved God. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Babaji Krishna. Babaji Krishna. Lahiri Mahashaya. Lahiri Mahashaya. Swami Sri Yateshwar. Swami Sri Yateshwar. Paramahansa Yogananda. Paramahansa Yogananda. Saints of all religions. Saints of all religions. We humbly come to thee. We humbly come to thee. O Divine Mother. O oh, Divine Mother, help us to see that Thou art the light. Help us to see that Thou art the light behind all darkness. Behind all darkness, lift our little consciousness into, our little consciousness. into Thy big consciousness. Into thy big consciousness. That we might perceive Thee within. That we might perceive Thee within. Everywhere. Everywhere. Oh, oh. Peace. peace. Amen. Amen. Please be seated, and we'll have some music. Yeah. <clears throat>
Our first chant is on page 26, What is This Life? second chant. It's on page 17 of the chant book, I Am the Sky. Oh, 
It's taking Lee's chance deep inside, taking a few deep breaths, getting our energy centered in the spine, just lifting that energy up through the heart devotion, through your heart's devotion, up to the point between the eyebrows, and call out there to the divine. Going deep as you can in the next few minutes.
Let's stay inwardly focused while I read these words from Affirmations for Self-Healing by Swami Kriyananda. The spiritual quality this week is love. One finds love not by being loved, but by loving. We can never know love if we try to draw others to ourselves, nor can we find it by centering our love in them. For love is infinite. It is never ours to create. We can only channel it from its source in infinity to all whom we meet. The more we forget ourselves in giving to others, the better we can understand what love really is. And the more we love as channels for God's love, the more we can understand that He he is the one love in all the universe. Our affirmation. I will love others as extensions of my own self. I will love others as extensions of my own self. And of the love I feel from God. And of the love I feel from God. I will love others as extensions of my own self. I will love others as extensions of my own self. And of the love I feel from God. And of the love I feel from God. I will love others as extensions of my own self. and of the love I feel from God. And now silently, I will love others as extensions of my own self and of the love I feel from God. Very silently with me, O infinite one, make me a channel for thy love. Through me, reach out to sow seeds of love in barren hearts everywhere. Om. Peace. Amen. Today's reading is from Rays of the One Light, weekly commentary on the Bible and Bhagavad Gita. This week's reading is Did God create the universe or become it? Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it and your deathless self within. Following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. The Gospel of St. John, chapter 1, contains a passage that explains the essential truth that creation is a process of becoming. The universe is not separate from God the Creator, but a part of Him, even as our own dream creations during sleep are figments of our own consciousness. God's is the life, God's the reality. Not a melody could be composed, not a poem written, were the melody and the poem not already there, simply waiting to be expressed. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Ego-directed desire is like static. It distorts the radioed messages of infinity. But the pristine impulse from the divine, undistorted by limitation and delusion, is the life that gives rise to all that is as the seventh chapter of the Bhagavad Gita states, I am the fluidity of water. I am the silver light of the moon and the golden light of the sun. I am the Om chanted in all the Vedas, the cosmic sound moving as if soundlessly through the ether. I am the manliness of men. I am the good, sweet smell of the moist earth. I am the luminescence of fire, the sustaining life of all living creatures. I am self-offering in those who would expand their little lives into cosmic life. O Arjuna, know me as the eternal seed of all creatures. In the perceptive, I am their perception. In the great, I am their greatness. In the glorious, it is I who am their glory. 
Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Oh, oh, oh. Good morning to everybody on this finally sunny day. <laughs> I have a sister that lives in Phoenix, Arizona, and, and just a couple days ago she, she emailed me and she said, oh, she said, joyous rain, joyous rain. <laughs> I said, oh, I have to email her back and I said, today, and I'll go, oh, joyous sun. Because <laughs> they'd been basically three, three months without any sun there, and this is kind of the season where they start to get their rain. Anyway, they were pretty dry, so it's just, you know, this play of Divine Mother, she's, she's so interesting. <laughs> uh, so I, I was in studying for this, this topic, I happened to come upon some, inf- some kind of feedback for uh, how our health. Not exactly pertaining to the topic, but it was kind of inter- it was kind of fun. Anyway, <clears throat> we all have these things that we like to eat and we don't like to eat, and you know, we nowadays with information like it is, <clears throat> there's lots of you know you should this and you shouldn't that and all that stuff. So here it is. It's the, the Japanese, as we know, they eat very little fat in their diet, and so um, you know they actually have a lot fewer heart attacks than the Americans and, and the British. British. And then also we have the French, and we look at their diet, and they actually eat quite a bit of fat in their diet. And yet they have fewer heart attacks than the Americans and the British. And then we look at the Italians, and, well, they just drink a whole lot of red wine. (laughs) And and yet they have fewer heart attacks than the the British and the Americans. And so now what kind of a conclusion can we draw from this, and it, apparently the conclusion is that it's speaking English is what, what kills you. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> that is a good one. <laughs> so if you, if you know another language, feel free to speak it. <laughs> so I want to just reread the Bible passage for this topic this morning because we actually missed the first topic, number one, which is uh, the eternal word, because we were having our Yogananda's birthday celebration. So we actually skipped it. So I just wanted to read it because the the topic that was read today, the Bible passage today, was actually excerpted from the same topic that that we would have read. And so it makes, kind of put it in context. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So you can see it was a bigger context. And um, I think the, the important thing about this topic today is not did God create the universe, but it's, or did God become the universe? Did, did God become it? Because most of us here, we're not, we've gotten beyond the, 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 you know, the debate about evolution versus creation. You know, that was the big thing back when I was in school. Being a biology major, I used to wrestle with, is it evolution or is it creation? And, you know, what, what was really the cause of, of all this life? Well, of course, now most of us, if you're here, I'm sure you're pretty much aware that, of course, there was creation. But have we ever thought of it in terms of God created the universe, but, but he actually created it by becoming the universe. And that's kind of a, a whole different way of looking at it. Um, the traditional way, and there was a, a cartoon from the New Yorker. I don't read the New Yorker, but I saw this in my information, a cartoon. And it was a picture of God, you know, drawn as a cartoon in his white robe, and he had the long white hair, and 
you know, very regal looking. And but he was holding a jar of bubble, bubble um, soap stuff, and he had one of these little, you know, thing, blow bubble things with a little loop and the handle, and he was dipping, you know, obviously dipping it in. It showed him in one of the frames, you know, blowing, and he blew out all these big bubbles, which were worlds, you know, all, all these planets. And I thought, you know, you know, if to some people that. Maybe it's still their understanding that somehow God created the world from whatever, you know, bubbles, why not? You know, how did he create it? But this great saints and sages, and now even more so than ever, science is beginning to say, you know, that's really not very accurate. We can't support it. Scientists cannot support the fact that it's, it's just materialistic stuff because it doesn't add up. The mathematical equations that they do to, to judge all this stuff, it, it, they can't make it work if they look at everything just being from the material viewpoint. It doesn't work. If, if you're interested in that scientific point of view, read this book that Joseph Selby just put out called The Physics of God. <clears throat> it's pretty remarkable how he ties in all the theories that the scientists have had um, all in the, from the physics standpoint, quantum physics and the new string theory and all the other things that are going on, <clears throat> how he ties it in with what the saints and sages have been telling us about God and creation. I mean, it all makes sense. So from that viewpoint, that God is, that God became creation. God didn't just make it happen um, by pulling who knows what from who knows where. Um, that is really what we're going to talk about this morning. And I wanted to um, read from Swami Kriyananda's Essence of Self-Realization. These are topics on many different subjects that he, he jotted down that Yogananda talk to him about. And so this particular topic was the essence of the dream nature of the universe. And Yogananda said this about that. He said, it is a mistake really to say that God created the universe. He didn't create it, at least not in the way a carpenter would construct a table. God became the universe without in any way altering his intrinsic nature. He manifested a portion of his consciousness as Meyer or the cosmic illusion. As the Bible says, a part of his consciousness moved and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. We might compare that motion to the motion of waves on the surface of the ocean. The ocean level never changes even when the waves rise very high for every upward movement at one place is compensated for a downward movement at another the overall water level remains the same. Even so, God, the ocean of spirit, remains unaltered by his creation. At the surface of his consciousness, however, his spirit moves, and that movement or vibration produces duality like the rising and falling of the waves on the sea. Nothing is as it appears to be. All that exists is a manifestation of the thoughts of God. <clears throat> That's pretty deep. <clears throat> and yet it's not. It's very simple. Very, very simplistic. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, uh, Yogananda is a story in the autobiography of, of a yogi where Yogananda was talking with a, a physicist. He was actually probably just listening to him because the physicist, of course, was... Um, trying to prove his point of view, and Yogananda was just listening. And the physicist was saying that, you know, Yogananda's concept of the world, that it was created by God, it was, he said that it's God's dream. It's just kind of a, a pleasant fancy, you know, to think that God is dreaming about the trees and dreaming about the life and everything that's here. It's just one, just God's dream. The physicist said, well, you know, science has proven that, you know, everything in this world is made out of protons and electrons. I mean, we know this. And Yogananda, <laughs> being who, who he was, um, just kind of easily, simply said, well, you know, just take this example. He said, wonder if we um, wanted to build a house, and so a big dump truck came along and dumped a big load of bricks, you know, in our yard. <clears throat> and um, 
then, you know, we, we waited. And do you think those bricks would just form into our house all by themselves? And the physicist looked at me and said, well, no, of course not. You know, we have to have, you know, some people there that, you know, have the intelligence and that know to actually take the bricks and build a house. And Yogananda said, yes, yes, isn't that true? He said, uh, um, nature is made out of the building blocks of nature are these electrons and protons that you've talked about. And, you know, they aren't just going to organize themselves into the, the rivers and the oceans and the animals and the plants and the minerals and all the stuff that's here. He said, it takes intelligence to do that. And so that's what is missing in your formula. You have to have intelligence. And I don't know what the, 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 phys, the physicist said, but I can imagine he, he, hopefully, he scratched his head a little bit on that one because it takes intelligence first and matter second. Because without that intelligence, how can there be anything here? Something had to have started it all. And the, the great sages say that, yes, this is how it happened. God's is infinite stillness. It's a vast intelligence that's infinitely still, no movement. And that stillness can also be described as love. It's just unconditional love. It can be described as the ever new joy. It can be described as peace and calmness, all those wonderful qualities that guess what? It's what we want. Because that presence is everywhere because that is God's consciousness. God didn't change himself, he just vibrated out a little piece of his consciousness, a vibration from the stillness that is God, the intelligence, that consciousness that is God, he vibrated out a little bit of that consciousness. And that vibration is movement, isn't it? Vibration is sound, vibration is energy. And so, that energy and sound that moved outward, and meaning moving outward, it began to get a little less subtle. Because God's consciousness is very refined, it's very subtle. If it wasn't, we'd all be there with him. It's very subtle, it, it takes a bit to find it. The great saints and sages have found that, and so they tell us that. And we can feel a little bit of that from those that come back to help us on our own journey towards that awareness of who we truly are. So this consciousness begins to kind of solidify a little bit as, he, as God pushes it out from himself. And it solidifies first as thought. You know, first he has to have thought, think about it. And then from the thought, he kind of has to make the blueprint. So we've got what we call the causal body, that first most subtle aspect of creation, and then the creation becomes a little less subtle in the astral plane, which is the plane of light. And it's, the, it's also kind of the blueprint of what's here on the, this planet Earth, because it's more subtle, but then again, it, it isn't as subtle as thought. It's beginning to form a little bit. And then when it condenses down a little bit more, it forms into this material world that we have. They say everything that's in this world, there's a blueprint for that in the astral plane, like your body. You know, you've got that perfect formation, but it's in the astral, it's in the energy form. And we call it light, because it's, it's perceived as that subtle light in the astral world, which is where we go when we lose our bodies. We don't really lose us, we're just losing this physical form that we think is us, because our egos identify it as us, but it's not. And the divine has told us this, but we have to learn what it is. We have to begin to know by practicing a lot of the techniques that Yogananda and the great ones and all religions have told us will help us so that we too can begin to perceive that reality and realize that this is just a dream. This is just God's dream. I know Yogananda um, would take his disciples to movies back then in the 30s and 40s. Movies were a little different than they were today. And, but he'd, he'd take them to the movies, black and white movies, and, and he'd, he'd always remind them, he'd, he'd say, look to the beam, look to the beam. He says, you know, it's so real on that screen, you can get so engrossed in those movies. But he'd remind them that, you know, it's not real. 
it's being projected. The light coming through the film at that time, you know, we used to use films. And it would, you turn around and you could see it. I remember seeing it. And, and you know, for those of you who used to go to the movies back then, you, know, you could see the, the light and the shadows projected through the, the movie camera. And Yogananda said, yeah, just light and shadows of the Lord. That's what this creation is, just light and shadows of the Lord. We're just this projection of consciousness. And Yogananda himself, when asked by the disciples if they liked the movie, and of course he'd always go, oh yeah, I really like the big movie. <laughs> because he was watching the big movie, he'd go into um, super consciousness at that point. He would just leave this physical world and just enjoy that world of the divine, where it really is, that pure love and joy, which is what, because, you know, it's circumference, it's center everywhere, circumference nowhere. That's God's energy, center everywhere, in every atom of creation. Because something with intelligence had to create what it is that we see all around us, including ourselves. And that intelligence is there within us. And so, but the circumference is nowhere because it just is an infinite process of expansion right now anyway. So that's what we're, 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 we're here to do is to take this dream that we're involved in, which can be a very nice dream sometimes, but sometimes it can be pretty bad. You know, that's what, that's what this universe is all about. When, when God vibrated his consciousness out into the physical world, he had to make duality, he had to make the bad and the good. Because otherwise, we'd all just go zooming back into God again. We'd go, well, I don't want this, you know. We, if, we, if we weren't fooled that thinking this was real, we'd just all zoom back into that consciousness of God. And so we're, we're playing out our dream here. And the process, the purpose, of course, is for us to begin to realize that it's not really real and that we don't really want all the stuff we think we want. We don't want to do all the things we think we want to do because it doesn't bring us what we want, which is that love and joy. You know, We don't get it this way out in this world. We don't get it. We get it only in the inner world because um, that's where we can detect it in the silence. When we become, when we become silent, we lift our consciousness through our techniques of meditation, through any techniques that can help you to feel still inside and begin that process of tuning in to the divine. Then, at that point, we begin to realize what that true consciousness is. I know the saints, of course, and sages have told us this, but you know, we just te- tell us something, it doesn't really usually work. We have to prove it for ourselves. So um, that's, that's okay. But, you know, just begin to do some of the teachings. You know, Yogananda said, if you just do 10% of what I tell you, and I'm sure other religions too, the true, the true masters, Buddha and um, Muhammad, some of those true masters, they, they had the truth. And so just do 10% will help us to really begin to understand the truth of all this. And then we can begin our journey. We're we're on it now. We're all on the journey, whether we're conscious that we are or not. But you want to start to be more conscious of it, because that will speed it up, and it will help you a great deal. I know when I was doing these readings that I wanted to kind of tune into a saint, and I remembered in the autobiography of a yogi that Yogananda dedicated his book to the great saint. He said, he said Luther Burbank, an American saint. And uh, I thought that was, I know when I first tuned into the autobiography, I thought that was kind of strange. It's like, huh? You know, I didn't think we had any saints in America. But anyway, it's okay. Um, the book was great. And so I went back and reread that chapter. I thought, well, you know, let me read, read more about it because I couldn't remember. Anyway, it's, it's interesting. Luther Burbank, as you know, was the great plant geneticist who um, lived down in Santa Rosa, California, and he became very well known, Burbank, you know, if you do anything with plants and vegetables or flowers, you know the name Burbank. He uh, created hundreds of new varieties of plants, and he did this um, by tuning into them. 
because the, the, te the techniques of grafting and some of those tools that they used were, were known at the time. But he took it a little further than that. Um, and these, these, these varieties that he created were just so much better. You know, they, the, the, uh, the walnut trees, they said he produced a variety of walnut trees that most of them, the normal ones, were producing walnuts after like 36 years. And he produced one, he started producing a variety that would produce just as good walnuts half the time. So you can see how this would help mankind. It would allow more food to come more quickly half the time. Um, and and he, he's, when, he's, when Yogananda used to visit him, because he obviously felt he was a great soul, and he used to, Burbank would say that his secret, he had very se secret for his plant breeding. I mean, why was he so successful in creating hundreds of new varieties, which were so successful? Tomatoes, the Burbank tomato, wonderful corn, cherries, all that stuff. Um, Burbank said, he said, the secret is, he said that I, I tune into love. He said, there's love all around us. There's love all within us. There's love in every single atom. And he said, I just tuned into that love and I gave the plants love. And, and I, I, I tuned into their secrets and they told me what I needed to do. So he was into that more subtle realm, wasn't he? He, he created the spineless cactus, which many of us know about. And uh, as you know, cacti is hard to handle. You know, they're, they're all those spines. They're pricky. You can't just go up to them and grab them. So he convinced cactus that he wasn't going to hurt them, that there was nothing to fear, that he loved them. And after some time, he created a spineless cactus. That breed still exists today because the cactus didn't need spines anymore. There was no fear. It was just faith and that love. So isn't that interesting? There's so much subtle stuff that we don't know about. But these great souls do, and they, they help us. Read about the great souls, the great saints. They teach us a lot. Everyone's a little different, but everyone has the same theme, that God is love, God is joy. It's that presence within us that all of us want. The Gita reading in today, in particular, I tuned into, it's all about nature. You know, I am the fluidity of the water, and I am the silver, uh, silver um, light of the moon. Just that nature theme um, that I really could tune into, because as you know, I've been um, someone that's been really close to nature myself all my life. One way is, is that I, I never would get lost. This is kind of a silly thing, but as, as a child, we lived in the way in the country, and I, that was my fun, as I'd just go wa wander around in the woods. And, you know, acres, miles, nothing, except woods and trees. And, and I'd go out as a little girl, and I had my older sister, who always followed me, and, you know, we just, I never got lost. I don't know how to say it. I used to just know. It's like, okay, I just knew where I was going and how to get back. And to this day, I still don't really get lost ever. I can get off track a little bit, but you know, I just—it's just a tuning in. Suddenly, I just know where to go. There's just a a sense of that. I know I I walk down to Meadowdale Beach quite often. Meadowdale—it's a nice little park that's fairly close to Linwood. It goes goes down through a gulch with a creek, and it um, it's it's kind of a little slice of nature you know, in this urban situation that we're in around here. So I go there because I find it, it, there's some peacefulness that I can really glean from that area. And, and I'll go down there, and I've done this for many years, and just tune in at the, at the water, Puget Sound, and just um, be there. Anyway, I, I started carrying my phone down there not too long ago. I've got a nice smartphone, of course. And, you know, there was some reason why I did it, and then I started carrying it. And then I began to realize that I was constantly, i get down there, and I'd tune, tap into my phone, and I'd start doing things with my phone, and I'd, I wouldn't be tuning into what was going on. I tell you, when I realized that, I mean, it, it's so subtle how this stuff works. It's just, it's just pulling me back out of it again. So now I don't bring my phone down there, because I can't seem to leave it alone and I can enjoy what's there and what it, it offers, which is just that it's a chance to tune into 
that presence of God because it's, it's very real. And I, I must admit, over the years, I've had some wonderful experiences um, out in nature. It's not the only place. I know of lots of people, you know, music. I love music, but I never had it as a child. And so I've had to learn that. But music is a wonderful way to just kind of tune into that higher, higher consciousness, those vibrations, they lift us up. Art, I know, is the ways many people feel lifted up and can kind of tune in. Athletics even, you know, for running. We've got a whole book on this, a person that runs. And, and, and I used to run. When you run, you sort of can kind of get into another zone. And I mean, really, what you're talking about is you begin to feel you're not a part of the body. You're, you're part of this higher consciousness. So whatever works for you, just try to, you know, in your busy life, we're here, we need to fulfill our duties and responsibilities, but at the same time, try to tune in to the higher aspects in whatever way works for you. You know, it's just gardening in your garden, just tuning into the plants. It's so different for everybody. So find out what works for you. And Bring it into your life as much as you can, because that's really what we're here for. Everything else is just still, it's just life, you know? And what we really want is to grow our consciousness, because when we leave this earth plane, we leave it at exactly where we are when we take that last breath. Whatever our consciousness is, that's what we've got, and that's what we take into the astral plane, where we are for a while, um, very much aware. You can read about all this stuff. It's in the, read the autobiography of a yogi and so the resurrection of Sri Yateshwar talks all about what it's like. It's amazing. You know, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful place. But eventually we come back because we have desires on this earth plane. We come back. But you'll come back exactly the way you left. Exactly with that consciousness. So do whatever you can to make it as high as you can. Um, and eventually, we don't have to come back. I mean, that's really the goal. For it. but so it's so interesting. Not everyone feels that way. I was talking to someone once, and I, I was just kind of describing that. And I shouldn't have. I, I they, they really weren't ready to hear a lot of what I was saying. I said, "Yeah, I don't, and I don't have to come back." And the other person said, "Well, gee, I was saying this is great. I want to come back." <laughs> you know, they, they like the idea of reincarnation. So anyway, it's just wherever we're at. So. So, just to end here, we're getting getting a little uh, a little far away. So I just wanted to end with um, the Bible blessing. There's the Beatitudes. I think that many of you are aware of, and the one that's blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall know God. For you know, pure in heart meaning no desires. You know, if you can just get in the flow and just go with it, you know. The good stuff, the bad stuff, it doesn't matter. You're labeling it. It's not to be labeled. It's just what it is. Just go with the flow, asking Divine Mother to help you, to keep your, your, your consciousness as high as you can, and just go with it. And just allow it to be, to help mold you into that higher self that you truly are. But that's what it's all about. I know um, every week in the Festival of Light that we do here, we lift up that candle and we get to pray with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my soul, with all my might. I choose thy love. I choose only thee. And that's really the crux of everything that I'm saying today. You got the whispers? Whisper. Let's listen to these words from Yogananda's book, Whispers from Eternity. O Father, I behold thee, above, beneath, behind, around, wherever I turn my gaze. Train the children of my senses never to stray from thee, who dwellest at the heart of everything. Turn my eyes inward to thy changeless beauty, Attune my ears to silence, that I may hear thy subtlest music. Breathe on me the heavenly scent of thy sacred presence. 
Orient wise, I will worship thee, placing the candles of my five senses on the altar of my love. Thus I will contact thee in the first pale shafts of dawn, absorb thee in the bright light of noon, expand in thee with the hidden glow of twilight, and merge in thee in the silver moonlight. Always will I keep a light on my inner altar, the mystic taper of my love for thee. I'd like to give you an opportunity to make an offering. Please take what you'd like to give, hold it in your right hand, and pray with me. Divine Mother, we offer to thee the fruit of our labors. Bless this offering, that it may serve as a channel of thy light to truth seekers everywhere. I'd like to read, uh, we're going to sing Home is a Green Hill, and I'd like to read a little excerpt from Swami Kriyananda from this book. A tale of songs that recently just came out. Home is a green hill. Often we dream of home as a specific place on earth. In fact, we are home wherever we happen to be on earth. God is center everywhere, circumference nowhere. And so it is also with us. A woman from England visiting Ramana Maharshi's ashram in India remarked to him, I've come a long way to get here. You haven't moved, he replied. The scenery around you has changed. A novel way to think of it. That, however, should ever be our reality. We gaze outward at the scenes passing around us, but we should ever be centered in ourselves and at home wherever we go. Blowing 
We have a few announcements. Uh, first of all, today, after service, we're going to have a healing prayer council here in this space just shortly after service is over. We also have the meditation teacher uh, extensive training coming up soon. And today at noon, we're going to have an opportunity for you to find out about that. And uh, Nancy, you want to stand up, Nancy? Nancy will be. Uh, taking Freeman's place and, and sharing a little bit. So if you have questions about this wonderful class, it's not only an opportunity to learn how to teach meditation to others, it also is an opportunity to go much deeper into your own practice. And I've taken that class and I found it to be very, very wonderful. So see Nancy at noon if you're interested in that. And am I right, Nancy, that the East-West one has been canceled? Okay, there, on the bulletin it says there's also going to be, two hours later, another class, uh, an introduction to uh, MTT, to Meditation Teacher Training at East West, but that will not be happening. So, also we have our Raja and Hatha Yoga Intensive coming up. This is our most comprehensive, most popular class at Ananda. It goes into all aspects of the Eightfold Path of Patanjali, as told in his sutras. And it really goes to the core of everything that we do at Ananda and what Ananda is about. It goes into the teachings that Yogananda brought to the West back in the 20s. So it's a wonderful class to really go deep into what we do here. And we are going to have two introductory classes. Uh, one will be... Excuse me here. And one will be on Tuesday, January 16, from 7 till 8. That's in Seattle at East West. And the other one will be on Thursday from 7 to 8 here at the uh, temple in Bothell. And uh, that's, what did I say? That's Thursday, January 18th. So, and the series itself is a three month series. We'll be starting later this month. So, join us for that. Thank you. We'll now have our Festival of Light, written by Swami Kriyananda. Let us lift up our hearts in a Festival of Light. The essence of this ceremony has been passed down from ancient times. O waves that we are on the bosom of the infinite sea, joyfully together let us celebrate our own greater reality. For now, by God's grace, our redemption is at hand. The promise has been given. The divine light returning anew to earth has given us power, as the Holy Bible proclaims, to become the sons of God. Into our hands have been delivered the sacred keys of awakening. The Lord, through the Bhagavad Gita, promised, even the worst of sinners by steadfast meditation on me speedily comes to me. Again in that holy scripture he declared, Even a little practice of this inward religion will free one from dire fears and colossal sufferings. And whereas suffering and sorrow in the past were the coin of man's redemption, for us now the payment has been exchanged for calm acceptance and joy. Thus may we understand that pain is the fruit of self-love, or as joy is the fruit of love for God. From sun and moon and all the stars, from glistening seas, high mountains, desert solitudes, and vast fruitful plains, and from the hearts of mankind and of creatures everywhere, goes up in wordless yearning a prayer for redemption. Please stand and repeat after me. O mighty source of all that is, from sorrow lead us to everlasting joy. From darkness lead us to infinite light. 
From death lead us to immortality. Om. Peace. Amen. Please be seated. A fledgling bird once flew out into the world, gained strength and wisdom, its parents told it, and what you acquire, share with others, even as we have shared with you, for you are a part of all that is. Thus, Lord, we left you countless eons ago. Ours was a holy mission. You charged us to learn great lessons from life, to be fruitful in the gifts you had given us, to expand and multiply them. Alas, we abandoned our mission. Instead, we hoarded selfishly, nor did wisdom come to us when repeatedly we lost everything we had. For the young bird in flight for the first time gloried in its newfound strength. It began to think how foolish I would be to share my strength with anyone. What else is wisdom if not to keep what is mine for myself? And so we, like that bird, entered upon the second stage of the soul's long journey away from its home in God, the stage which is called the revolt. That bird's brief day was like eons of our time. When afternoon came, it entered a storm cloud and soon found itself struggling for its life. Wind and rain lashed at its wings. The more it fought back, the weaker it became. Give yourself into my hands, cried the wind. To your strength I can then add my own. At last the little bird heeded this counsel, and then suddenly it found itself soaring joyously high above the clouds. Hours passed, and night fell. The little bird grew afraid. How, it cried, can I fly in this darkness? And the night whispered, Fear not, for lo, peace awaits you in the unknown. Surrender to me, and your strength will be renewed. And after a time, the tiny rebel surrendered and found the night's counsel true. And rain and sky and grassy fields all sang, Behold, your very strength to fly has never been your own. Look to the source of all power, if you would conquer fear and weakness. And the bird asked, Where can I find that source? And they answered, Seek it in the farthest depths of being in your own self. Thus gradually the bird entered that third stage of the journey which is called the quest. We now, like that little bird, have come to realize that buffeting winds are life's way of giving us strength and courage, that even fear, like shadows on a statue, gives light and substance to hope. From the depths of unknowing, Lord, we cry out to thee, Is there no lasting purpose to our lives? Behold, all that we thought was light was but darkness. Who are we in reality? For what end were we made? Ever and again, through your awakened sons, the answer comes. The forming of stars and moons and planets, of galaxies revolving on the tides of space, of drifting continents, upheaving mountains, snowy wastes, and dark, silent ocean deeps, head but this for its design, the birth of life, and with life's birth the dawn of self-awareness, passage through dim corridors of waking consciousness to emerge at last into infinite light, into perfect joy. O children of light, forsake the darkness. Please stand. Know that forever you and he are one. Raise your hands in chanting Om. Ask that the power of God replenish you in body, mind, and soul.
be seated. Such, O Lord, was your promise. Gaze upon this light as a symbol of God's love. A prayer of love went up from earth and you responded. A ray of your light flashed out from the heart of infinity, burst downward through night skies of consciousness, and was born on earth for the redemption of mankind in human form. Many times has that light descended, drawn to earth by the call of aspiring love. Your chosen people have always been those of every race and nation who with deep love chose thee. Please pray with me. O Lord, Lord, with all my heart, with all my my mind, mind, with all my soul, soul, and with all my strength, strength, I choose thy love. I choose choose only thee. The infinite Christ consciousness, the only begotten, has come down anew to earth for the salvation of mankind. When we need you, Lord, our beloved, you descend. Our human griefs, your love alone can mend. By proud indifference unaffected, though eternally rejected, you remain our friend. Long we fear to face your love Lest our emptiness it prove No, but last our hearts we give you Who remain our friend Long Eyes filled with divine love, Jesus appeared to the great master, Babaji. The lights on the high altar of my church, he said, have been growing dim. Those still lit on lower altars of good works, the noble taper of inner communion with the Lord burns low and is ill attended. Let us together, united in Christ's love, set lights ablaze on that high altar once again. Thus a new ray of light was sent to earth through the great master's this path. Greater can no love be than this, from a life of infinite joy and freedom in God, willingly to embrace limitation, pain, and death for the salvation of mankind. Such ever has been the sacrifice of the great masters for this world. Here then is the fourth and last stage of the soul's long journey through time and space, the redemption. Lord, we offer up the little light that is in us into thy blazing light of infinity. Grant us the grace to know thee and make us ever increasingly pure channels of thy love to all. Please stand. Thy light within us shining
we celebrate the grace of God that has come anew to earth through our line of gurus, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Sri Yateshwar, and Paramahansa Yogananda. This grace is eternally channeled to mankind by great masters in every religion. It has been given new clothing by our gurus to reflect man's dawning awareness that matter is only a manifestation of divine energy. In God, all are equal, not only Jesus Christ, Lord Krishna, and the great saints everywhere, but even in essence, those on earth who have sinned most greatly. Joyfully lifting up our hearts in song, we pray that we who earnestly seek communion with your light receive it in our lives abundantly. Father, Mother, Friend our God, we thy wonders all acclaim. Father, Mother, Friend our God, we thy wonders all acclaim. May our thoughts be only of thee, train our hearts to invite those who feel so inclined to come up to the altar and receive the touch of light from the masters. As you approach, offer a prayer of gratitude to the infinite Christ, in whose love our line of masters have descended, that we might all come to God. Pray too for the grace to share with all as you have received, for you are a part of all that is. May the light of Christ the infinite consciousness shine upon you. Om Christ, Amen. Om Christ, oh. Om Christ, Amen. Om Christ, oh.
Let's stand and send out to the world all the blessings we've received. Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Master, Paramahansa Yogananda, may we remember in every moment of every day that you are with us. May we listen for your voice, whether at home or work. Whether at school or temple, you are always waiting for a conversation with us. For you are everywhere. Be with us always. Om. Peace. Amen. Go out with joy. Gentlemen, could we have a blessing for Matt and Sue as they're leaving for India? Sure. Matt and Sue are leaving for India. Let's have them come up here. And... <laughs> okay, well, let's hold these two great souls in God's light. <laughs> they're, coming, they're coming back. Yeah, they are coming back. Okay, let's send them God's blessings.
Snacks next door. Is this on? Yep. Yeah, hear it. Yeah. And if you're new to Ananda, welcome. And you can speak to Chandi or Carol in the back, somebody in blue, or even me. Okay. <laughs> Blessings on your day. <laughs> 